Well, the seventh fire, hard to believe. Glad to be here, glad you're all here as well. What we're gonna be talking about over the next uh, 25 minutes, I guess it is, the timer tells me, is uh, cloud computing. So there's been some comments made earlier about, uh, by Mark about cloud computing. There's been some, uh, Mr. Hagel made some remarks as well. What we have with us is a, a very distinguished panel of cloud computing experts. These four people, four gentlemen, probably know more about cloud computing than anyone else in the world, and I'm uh, honored to be here to have the conversation with them today. I'm uh, John Thompson. I'm the CEO of U.S. Operations for a company called Cognitio. We deal with big data and have big data in the clouds and lots of analytics around that. And with me is Russ Daniels from HP. So why don't you guys go down the line and introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Russ Daniels. I'm the uh, VP and CTO for Cloud Services Strategy at HP. I'm Amitabh Shivastav. I'm the senior VP for Windows Azure. That's the operating system for a cloud. I'm Werner Vogels. I'm the chief technology officer of Amazon.com. And we also offer uh, infrastructure as a service. And I'm Rowan Trollop. I work at Symantec. And I'm the senior vice president over the consumer business. Okay. Well, you know, there's been a lot of discussion. I, I tried to get Sam to fill the stage with dry ice so we would be in a cloud while we were doing this, but that didn't happen. So um, theatrics aside, let's, let's start out with some very practical definitions of what cloud is. Werner, like, give, us, give us your view on what a cloud is. Um, now, first of all, I think what all of us know and wh why we're here struggling or struggling and why we're being asked every time to give a definition of the cloud is that the definition of, of the, the, the use of the word cloud came after the, that the technology was already, I think, in progress or being built. And from Amazon's point of view, we focus on infrastructure services. Yeah. Um, but I think actually there's a number of definitions out there that in my eyes make sense. And the one that I like most is one done by Gartner. It says, um, you know, cloud computing is a style of computing where you have massively scalable IT-related capabilities that are provided as a service over the internet to multiple customers. And, and internet can be public and private, and, and there's some variations there. I think there's two things missing from that definition. One is that I believe that those services need to be, able, need to be available in an on-demand fashion, and you need to have a pay-to-go model with respect to the use of those services. Okay, I would agree with that. Uh, Amitabh, what do you, how would you extend or change that? Um, let me. The, the way we view the cloud is as a massive geo-distributed computer uh, that is spread across the globe. And um, it consists of you know, commodity machines, uh, network, uh, you know, load balancers, switches, um, which are you know, made available as a service. So the approach that we're taking is that um, we want to build an operating system that manages this massive cloud infrastructure and makes it available with two goals. One is by managing the resources efficiently, you can drive the cost down, the OPEX and the CAPEX, the two numbers that matter the most in the data centers. And the second is by masking all the complexity, you can provide a rich set of abstractions so developers can go build uh, their services very easily. Mm -hmm. The key uh, point that I, I wanna make is that we view the cloud as an extension of the ex existing IT. And so there are new opportunities for developers to build a new class of applications that span the three screens, the TV, the PC, and the phone, you know, backed by a cloud. Okay, great. Now, Russ, I know it's in our earlier conversations, we talked about the abstractions and the value on top of, you know, some of the infrastructure that Werner talked about, some of the extensions that Amitabh put on it. What's HP doing with the cloud in, in extending it beyond just being able to provision two or three servers here and be able to get capacity on demand. What's, what are you actually doing with this thing? Uh, I th it's, um, so I think it's, it's a classic example, I think, of the industry because we're, we excel more than anything about taking a word that gains some con <laughs> currency and just piling on top of it to, to use it to define everything that we've already been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, PowerPoint slide decks all over the world have now had word cloud slapped <laughs> liberally across them. Yeah. Um, so we think there's two things going on. We think they're both important. And one of them, a year ago or a year and a half ago, we all would have been talking about as utility computing yes. in some form. Adaptive infrastructure, on-demand computing, real-time infrastructure, 
organic IT. Pick your analyst, pick your vendor, you get a different name for it. It's really important because what it allows you to do is to be able to host uh, complex workloads and be able to deliver them in different ways with different economics associated with them. And the economic component is huge because that's one of the, it's, an, it's the opportunity to solve a set of problems in ways that allow you to get after different markets or to you know, take some of the heat off that you get from the CEO. But there's another thing going on which is really that the cloud allows you to go and build New, time, new types of solutions to solve problems that really are out of reach of traditional uh, IT approaches. And it's that, that's where the value is, that's where the opportunity is. Okay. So when HP thinks about this, we of course think about both of those components. We have a lot of business in that server storage network, management software, helping customers be able to take advantage of those kinds of capabilities in their own data centers as well as potentially externally, ones we might host, ones that others do. But we're also very excited about the opportunity to go and use technology-enabled services to reach new customers mm -hmm. and to help our enterprise customers use those technology-enabled services to distinguish their businesses. Okay, very good. Roman? Yeah, I think that's a fairly workable definition for something that we've already been doing and a, and a set of architectures that have been evolving over time. We really think about, or I really think about, the uh, security in particular coming from Symantec. And, and also consumers. And, and if you look at in the consumer space, a lot of what they're experiencing as cloud is already here. Uh, you know, for my, for my wife, for example, I've got her computer com configured in such a way that all of the applications she uses are in the cloud. So she's not using any local applications. And so I think the sort of the, the notion that we're in the post-PC era, backed by cloud computing, if we want to call it that, that's here, and that's now, and it's, and it's today. Mm -hmm. And there's real concerns that people have, I think, when you, talk, when you start to talk about cloud, and especially in, in IT context, or in IT conversations, where people start to do the high-speed hand-wringing is around, well, what about my data? You know, how, how's my data gonna be secure, and who's gonna, where is it really gonna be? And when you start to layer in uh, the CIO concerns around SOCs and you know, customer data management, this is where I think cloud computing gets, to, it gets kind of muddy. Uh, and, yeah. and it becomes really, really challenging. So I, I think there's a lot of challenges ahead of us to actually making this a reality on the security side. Right. Yeah. Now, in, in our organization, we use uh, Salesforce.com ubiquitously throughout the company. We use it for our Salesforce. We use it for customer relationship management. We use it for technical support cases. We use it for all sorts of things. Uh, personally, I, I don't see that as a, as a cloud infrastructure. I see that as a, a software as a service play that may, ha may or may not have a cloud behind it. So, you know, eyebrows raised. Uh, you know, let's have some reaction to that, Werner. Well, I think, uh, you know, you'll see different, th there's different ways of looking, you know, doing abstractions and architectures here. Yeah. And I think it's clear that cloud includes infrastructure as a service. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of services that Amazon's been offering. And, you know, we're pretty, re really successful, actually, in that. In, both in the young business space as well as in the as well as in the enterprise space, where you offer you know storage and networking and databasing and and all of these basic fundamental building blocks. Um, I think the layer on top of that, what you see, is, is platform as a service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and whether those are programming platforms, um, you know, whether it's J2E as a service, whether it's you know Ruby as a service, or anywhere where you have containers, programming containers, where people can build applications that scale at that particular level. Uh, but not only programming environments, what we see is quite a few enterprises that are moving into the cloud um, are not only moving into the cloud for their own you know, cost savings or for the agility reasons or for high security or, or availability, but they also become platform providers themselves. And I think that's where the real exciting is at the platform level, yeah? mm -hmm. where telcos move into the cloud not only to get their cost savings, but also to be offer, offering particular services, whether it's locality-based services, whether it's speech services, whether it's voice, um, in the cloud, such that new, uh, new type of applications can be built there. So it's platform as a service. On top of that, we'll have a whole range of different applications being built. Um, that is what we traditionally have known as software as a service, I believe. Mm -hmm. Now, Salesforce definitely sits there. It's a, it's a large enterprise application that sits in the cloud, scales dynamically, without that you actually, as a consumer, have to worry about how that actually works. Okay. Um, so I think that's, that's the different layering that you can look at that, right. and I think all of them 
can be considered cloud services. But you know, here, we, we are making up a definition. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> what really matters is that there is enormous IT capabilities available, yeah. Yeah, and that we see a whole range of new application platforms and applications being built on top of that that will drive innovation that we've not seen before. Right. Now, there's, there's been a, a theme last night and, and today in some of the sessions of being alarmist. So I thought I must hack, ask some alarmist questions. Uh, so I was thinking about it, and Amitabh, you know, uh, I think John Hagel was the one that said that uh, he felt that cloud was, was nothing more than low-cost outsourcing. Uh, if, if that is the case, which none of us believe, uh, do we believe that cloud has the potential of hollowing out organizations as they don't have the capacity to bring in infrastructure, uh, computers and software, and manage that infrastructure as they outsource it to uh, organizations in the cloud. Is that a danger that we're all going to move into a world where we lose the ability to manage our own infrastructures? So I I'll say a, a few points. One is um, this is a you know cloud. Um, you know when we talk about cloud, is there really a big buzzword these days? And sometimes the hype actually even overtakes where, where we are technologically there. Um, I use the, fam the my favorite quote is that um, we are only five minutes into the first quarter. We don't even know what we don't know. Um, and that is why um, the, and cloud is more than just outsourcing your hardware. Um, you know, and that is where the, the cost element gets so focused on that you lose the, the, the TCO or the total cost of ownership that you, that you go on. We have a very large enterprise business, and we have spent a lot of time talking with a lot of the enterprise customers about, you know, um, and that is why the strategy that we came up with was that if you view the cloud as an extension of the on-premises IT, because if you talk to customers, there's a def there's a, there are challenges of what does compliance mean. Compliance is very well understood when you are um, talking about on-premises. When you start going to the cloud, it becomes, um, uh, you start getting into the gray area. What does security mean? Um, you know, then even if you get past all the technical issues, then there is this whole sense of trust. You know, you start getting the personal thing. I can explain to you why everything will be fine, but I just don't feel right. You know, you're gonna get into it. So that is why if you, because the cloud is in a much, much more general approach, if you view that as an extension, then different enterprises with different workloads will move now, some will take years to move over, and people will figure it out. And that is why if we go, we have taken the approach of building a more general purpose platform that not just handles the existing apps, but also allows uh, you know, creation of the new generation of apps. Okay, great. Now, Russ, you, had, you said that there were certain types of applications and abstractions at HP that you were thinking about building on top of that. Can you elaborate what those types are? Are they certain categories of applications? Are they yeah. across class? Or? Yeah, I, I, let, me, let me build slightly on what Amitabh just said because we think again that there's two questions. One for the IT function in a business, which is how do I source and deliver the services that the business needs? And those business services, those services tend to focus on automation of business process and individual productivity. Those are the two places where we've used technology for the most, most part for value for businesses today. And we think that there are more choices available today than there was in the past about how to source those services. They could be on-premise or off-premise. They could be run in dedicated environments or in highly virtualized, automated, shared environments. Mm -hmm. You get different economics. You get different security concerns. Uh, all of those choices are valid, and so we think that most enterprises will work in a hybrid form for the long term. A lot of the things that you're doing today, you're going to continue to do that same way because that's what makes most sense. In the same way that, much to HP's chagrin, there's still a lot of stuff running on mainframes. Not what we'd recommend, but somehow that's still where, uh, where people end up. It's less of an issue now that we have EDS because we help run some of those mainframes for you. But, but um, So that's one thing. But we think there's something else that's going on. And again, when we think about this broader vision of the cloud, we view it as the next phase of evolution of the internet itself. And it allows us to solve a different set of problems. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about those problems is it's really consistent with uh, some of the, some of the comments this morning, rather than being about 
automation of business process. It's around using technology-enabled services to be able to improve communication and collaboration, to support the conversations that we have, the interactions that we have. Humans aren't really very process-centric in our nature. If you want to get people out of a room, just say, hey, let's go ahead and spend some time uh, working on improving our processes. Because <laughs> everybody thinks, OK, you're a bureaucrat, and they're trying to figure out how to get out. And if you really want to chase them out, say, well, instead, let's work on governance. Because now it's not just you're a bureaucrat, but you're a fascist. <laughs> so, but it's deep in human nature that we don't like these things. And most of what we do, most days, isn't around implementing processes, but it's this recurrent pattern of interactions, of conversations. And technology doesn't help us much today. Yeah, I, this is a collaboration. The technology that's in this room, there's something that's projecting on the screen. But other than that, the primary use of technology in this room is to allow you to do your email or other things rather than engage in the interaction here. It's we true. don't have the technology facilitating what it is we're trying to do. We aren't capturing work products. I mean, the good news is this is being recorded, so that's another example. But my point is that there's a lot of opportunities to use technology to improve those issues around communication and collaboration, mm -hmm. to have a richer connection between businesses and their customers, suppliers, partners, channels. And those things we tend not to be successful with when we try to automate using traditional approaches because we can't enforce process across broad ecosystems. True. That's very difficult. It's hard to get processes enforced within a very small ecosystem, yeah. Yeah. across <laughs> ecosystems. Now, Werner, um, I know that in the, your past life, before you came to Amazon, you spent a fair amount of time in research working on grid computing, which is uh, you know, a theme that I've, I've been talking about here at FIRE over the, over the years. Uh, it, it's good to see that uh, GRID has been subsumed into a larger movement and, and is moving out into the world and is being used uh, more in a utility kind of basis. I, I think that's just a statement in fact. I don't think anyone would argue with that. What I'd like you to comment on next is, is two things. Uh, well, let's go with one thing. Um, the economics of cloud computing is dramatically different than on-premise computing. And is that one of the reasons why people are coming to Amazon? And how much of a driving factor is that in, in moving to clouds? So actually, I think the main driver to the cloud, and I want to take a, a piece out of John Hegel's book this morning, is flexibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And I think the flexibility is what drives the cost savings. Okay. The fact, I mean, when we think about scaling, often we think about scaling stuff up. Stuff needs to be bigger and more. But equally important is the ability to scale down. Yes. So, in a, in a world where there is um, you know, intensifying competition, an abundance of products, um, you know, increasing consumer choice, there's great uncertainty in the market whether or not your products are going to be successful. So mm -hmm. drivers for that need to be that you need to be able to acquire and release your resources on demand. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to pay as you go and only for those resources in the true utility sense. Mm -hmm. So I think the drivers are more the fact that you have flexibility in acquiring and releasing resources whenever you need them, and that drives, that drives the cost savings. Mm -hmm. Of course, at the same time, these resources actually are available in, you know, they've be, they can have better security, better availability, better performance, uh, you know, um, and better reliability than what you may be able to achieve on, on your own premises because you do not have that uh, uh, ex expertise, or you can only achieve that at much higher cost then that you can get that from, from a cloud provider such as Amazon. OK, great. We're gonna, I'd love to ask a million other questions, but we just don't have the time. So uh, one of the premises of the FIRE is to always reach out into the future and tell everybody what's coming down the road five years from now. So let's go one at a time, and, and what will cloud be in five years from now? Uh, it, it will have been, it'll probably be cloud 3.0 or cloud 4.0 by, <laughs> <laughs> by then. Um, so what we're excited about is that because of the economics and because of the ability to scale and flex, there's a class of problems that we can address that we think really have been out of reach. And it's around being able, being able to make these rich connections, being able to, to facilitate these kinds of conversations. Um, the, that, those connections end up being made through data. Mm -hmm. So it's another one of the key <coughs> architectural considerations is that it's not about having a bunch of processes that you knit together. 
but it's being able to capture huge amounts of data and capturing in a form that it's, that's optimized for sharing, so you can leverage it to make those kinds of rich connections. The cloud really is about context. The cloud in five years will increasingly be the context for our lives and for our businesses. It's the way that technology-enabled services will be able to help us get our jobs done. That's where all of the opportunities, the, the upside business value opportunities that we see. Great, Amitabh? So the way we see it is that um, the cloud platform will get more and more integrated with the, with the enterprise IT, uh, the, the mobile platform, the PC platform, and the, and the, and the, and the, uh, and the TV. Um, so we'll see each of these platforms being, getting more and more integrated. Even though, you know, because each of these platforms offer their own unique value, they will still get used in their own unique spaces. But the overall experience is gonna get unified for developers, users, and IT users. And the way it'll happen is that, you know, through common tools, so that, that whether you're managing your own IT, a public cloud, or a private cloud, the IT should be able to use the same set of tools. The developers should be able to use the same programming model by having a unified programming model. They should be able to develop their apps in a uniform way which span these multiple, uh, you know, the, these aspects there. So I see, we see more of the cloud going on, more of a seamless integration with all the existing platforms. Very good. Bernie? If I would know how it would look like five years from now, <laughs> I, um, um, even if I look back, you know, if I look back a year ago or two years ago, or three, three years ago when we launched our first services, Amazon S3 and EC2, the storage and the compute services, the word cloud computing didn't exist. Uh, there's, there's a Jeff Bezos on the front page of Business Week that says Amazon's risky bet, and, and everybody thought we're crazy. Yeah, and if I look at every year after that, I continue to be surprised, first of all, what our customers are doing with this. There is, it is driving so much innovation, it is unbelievable. And I think if that, what we will see in the coming years is that we'll be completely surprised time after time about what kind of innovation, just the, the, the availability of shared amount, enormous amount of resources can help young businesses and also enterprises go into. Mm -hmm. Um, if, I, um, if you look at platforms such as Facebook, yeah, if you develop an application for Facebook, you need to be aware that if you launch that application, you may become popular overnight. Mm -hmm. That means instantly you're in front of 200 million users. Yeah, we had one, one customer um, that, that was normally using something like 50, 50 servers from us, um, launched a Facebook app and needed to scale up to 3,500 in two days. Yeah, because if not, they, as a business, they would have been dead in the water and nobody would have wanted to use them. Um, and I think that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. yeah? We will we'll see that in all of these platforms will force uh, access to highly reliable, highly secure, uh, scalable uh, uh, services that, haven't, that, weren't that weren't available before. Yeah. And I think innovation is something that will surprise us for the coming four or five years. Beautiful, that's great. Roman? I'll, I'll take a different approach to answering the question. Um, I think the future is really, really messy. Uh, and when I think about the cloud and the, the potential that it offers us, I mean, certainly there's a lot of things that we could go and do. But when you think about how the, the, the diffraction of data and information and applications across a very complex set of infrastructure, uh, when you just play that forward by five years, and you think about, you don't really know where the data is, you don't know where your applications are really running, you don't know who owns what in the, back, in, in the infrastructure, and to the degree that that infrastructure is closed, so you have tremendous complexity, you have a tremendous amount of abstraction and opaqueness. And so one of the things that I believe is we have to push for openness uh, in cloud infrastructure and utility computing. We have to push for openness because you know, when I think about what's, you know, an analogy here is the, the financial system and what's happened, right? And what did we go through? We went through a situation where we had, you know, information asymmetry. We had people that didn't know what was going on. We had a lot of uh, relationships that tied everything together in ways that were very complex and hard to unbundle. And a similar thing could happen if you think about your future world in cloud computing, where that information is all over the place and where 
some of those infrastructure providers go down, what's going to happen to our infrastructure and, and the way that we get used to living in the future? So I think it's, uh, it's interesting, but it's messy. I do believe it is messy, no doubt about it. And with that, we've, we've run out of time. Uh, we're now over time. So thank you very much.